the project that we uh, we started uh, four years ago, actually it was over four years ago, if you'd probably uh, suggested to me that it would have taken four years, um, probably wouldn't have done it. But um, I'll get into the reasons why, uh, and it hasn't uh, detracted from, from what we think is, uh, has been a big success. But uh, I alluded to the fact that Durham's growing very quickly uh, this morning when we were talking from on the panel. And as I say, D uh, Durham is on the eastern border of Toronto, on the north shore of Lake Ontario. And uh, our population will double within, uh, within less than 20 years. And it's critical for us, even though we reside on the shores of a great lake, we use water efficiency to uh, reduce the cost of that growth so we don't have to grow the infrastructure in lockstep with, uh, with population growth. And uh, this, what we decided to do is to work with a new home builder, in this case it was Tribute Communities, um, to see what we could do as a municipality to uh, make new homes more water efficient. About 65% of our, our customer base is residential, so this is a significant issue for us. The sponsors from the program are Natural Resources Canada, who are the stewards of Energy Star in Canada, and the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, who are advocates for municipalities, obviously, at the, uh, at the national level. What we wanted to do was to, uh, to take some very small steps, you know, what in, in hindsight, um, in making new homes more water efficient. So what we did is we took um, homes that were, we took homes that were in the same neighborhood and we upgraded some and, and left the others in builder standard form. The upgraded homes, we changed the fixtures, the shower heads, and uh, upgraded to Energy Star appliances, and we also uh, put in um, drought-tolerant front gardens. We also chose this neighborhood um, because we wanted to, to uh, do the upgrades in starter homes so that the, the whole issue of upgrading and using premium products wasn't going to be perceived as being something that you, you only do when your house is worth a half a million dollars. So these are starter homes, the majority of which were 30 on 30-foot lots, both townhomes and single-family dwellings. When you got up to 56-foot lots, they were probably about 10% of, uh, of the neighborhood. So we wanted to stress the affordability. Uh, these are the kind of the median homes, the 37-foot lot homes. What we did is we, in order to sell the project, we treated it like any other upgrade. We put in, in the sales office, we put up a display that uh, portrayed the, uh, the upgrades on the same letterhead or, or uh, the same aesthetic um, present presentation as the, uh, the rest of the information in the, uh, in the sales office. The bottom line is, is the package sold out really quickly. We had uh, 90 homes that, that were so equipped. We used three types of toilets, and again, we were starting in 2004 with, uh, with the project. So in all the powder rooms, we put in uh, dual flush toilets. In about 75% of the upstairs bathrooms, we used one gallon for fl per flush power uh, pressure assist toilets. And then in the remaining 25% uh, of the upstairs bathrooms, we used uh, a toilet that costs about the same as the toilet that the builder now uses. Uh, so we wanted to prove to them that they could use a better product without having to spend more money. And of course, that's changed now in the, in the intervening four years. There's a lot of other toilets, including HETs, that would compete price-wise with what builders use. Um, because one of the ways we got our foot in the door with Tribute was to suggest that they were probably wasting a lot of their customer service staff time chasing toilet problems. And they admitted to us that over half of their customer service staff time was spent chasing toilets. And we suggested that was because they used crappy toilets. And they didn't kick us out, so that was good. So we had, you know, again, four years ago, we had a very small slate of, of, uh, of front load washers to choose from. It turned out we used uh, a frigid air appliance. Um, we also, um, in addition to tracking the differences in water, I in water use, because we're looking at dishwashers and clothes washers, we needed to be able to quantify the electricity use and the natural gas use so that we'd have a more holistic picture of the of the savings. And to that end, we've been able to calculate greenhouse gas reductions as well that are attributable to those uh, reductions. And finally, I'll present a cost benefit at the end of it as well. In order to measure the changes, we <laughs> embarked on something that was foolhardy. Um, all of the homes had their 
outdoor water meters, their natural gas meters and electricity meters read every, every month. But then for 10 homes of the study homes and of the control homes, we installed submeters. The submeters in the case of the water, uh, the, the water consumption or the water uses that we were trying to track, we, we put meters on both uh, outdoor faucets, a dishwasher, so it was a hot water meter. Clothes washers had both a hot water and a cold water meter on them. And then we had one on the hot water supply so that we could capture um, the residual, which is predominantly showers and bathing. We didn't do toilets because of previous AWARF studies. We knew fairly well what the toilets were going to be responsible for. We also submetered the electricity uh, as well. And we did, again, the dishwasher, the fridge, the stove, the clothes washer and dryer, and then the whole home. It was a heck of a lot easier. You'll see in a minute. Uh, the two, two methods of, of sub-metering. But in both cases, we had uh, radio frequency meters. Um, and we had, so we had remote communication. We could take the, the, reader, the meter readings as often as we wished without intruding. And believe me, the intrusions were a big issue because we started doing the sub-meter uh, installations in um, November, October of 2005. And remember, we're only trying to put meters in 20 homes. It took us until the following May to get them all done. And so that was just uh, a whole uh, new level of education for me in deal dealing with humanity. It was great to get people, <laughs> it was great, it was very easy to get people to commit to say, you know, we'll, we'll install these meters. Then the hard part came when we said, we need a half a day of your time. Preferably, dur preferably during the, d the day. And that's when the problem started. If people would, would say, yes, we're set for this such and such a date, and then they wouldn't be home, and, and it just dragged on and on. But our contractor didn't, didn't kill anybody and didn't, s didn't commit suicide, so we, we started the meter uh, monitoring in September of, of 2007. This is the water meter. So it looks like a conventional water meter, only it's a radio frequency meter, so that uh, we could... Uh, read it as often as we wished. And we also, it also enab enabled us to, to troubleshoot. So if, if a meter went down or wasn't, it wasn't reading, then uh, we knew right away. One of the things that, that happened initially, which still floors me, we were going around, there were three of us, and of course we should have had you know, magnetic signs on the side of our cars and saying you know, we were from the region of Durham. But no, we were just loitering around for the better part of a half a day driving around with a laptop on, on the seat trying to see which meters were reading so that we knew where we had to boost the signal. And the house, we had a central house that was going to uh, house the fixed reader which would receive all of the readings from all of the water meters and it was central in the neighborhood. I got a call f 10 o'clock on a Friday night from this, this homeowner says, I want out. And I said, you want out of what? Out of the whole study. And so it turned out that the neighbors across the street who were home watching this all day um, just inspired some kinds of, of paranoid theories in, in, the, in the surrounding homes and to the point where these people were freaked out. And the other thing we found out too is that when the uh, contractor um, connected the electrical submeters to their phone line, there was a buzzing on their phone line, so they thought we were bugging their phones as well. <laughs> so... We ended up putting the fixed reader on a lamp post near, near the house, and I managed to keep that house on. So this is what the, um, the submeters and the, and the data loggers look like on the electrical box. It's essentially another electrical box in the basement. 